It's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Hello, and welcome to Accelerate. I'm excited to talk with my guest today. Joining me all the way from Sydney, Australia, John Smybert who's co-founder and CEO of Strategic Selling Group out of Australia, as I said, which, as it turns out, I think Australia is actually a pretty fertile ground for some top sales thought leaders. We've had a couple on the, the show, and we're going to have some more coming up. So, John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Andy. Really delighted to be here. And good. I guess I should be saying good evening, but good morning here in Sydney. <laughs> yeah, that's why I stay with, with good day. So, uh, or good day, I guess. We have to try to get good that day. accent day, right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I mentioned to you before that yeah, I'd spent a bunch of time in Australia, and, and uh, yeah, I used to go running around the Royal Botanical Garden in Sydney, and yeah, do the loop out to the Opera House and back up to my hotel, and yeah, like, I don't know, I must have looked like a local because I'd always get stopped and asked for directions by people from America. <laughs> Glorious part of the world, though, isn't it? Oh, spectacular! Absolutely spectacular. Mm. So, one of the topics I really want to dive into, and, and you've talked about this on on. Uh, some video blogging you've done on your site is, is, you know, that maybe there's too much sales automation being used today. I mean, maybe the answer is less automation and more selling. I mean, it seems like, you know, certainly there are spectacular benefits to sales automation. I use it. I'm sure you use it. You know, I wish it had been available in the way it is today when back when I was carrying a bag and managing sales teams and had my own territory and things. But But are we running the risk of taking automation too far and really reducing our chances of having really effective business engagement. And I uh, really want to talk about that with you. So before we do, though, take a second to introduce yourself. Give us some more background on you. Sure, Andy. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a, a very mature old sales guy. Uh, actually <laughs> retired out of the corporate world 11 or 12 years ago. Um, background is mainly IT corporates, uh, IBM, NCR, Unisys, Fujitsu. That really covered close to 40 years. Mm-hmm. Um, and since then, I've been on uh, on this uh, pilgrimage trying to elevate the professionalism of sales because I, I saw back in, in my heyday, I, uh, the, the sales people were developed from the ground up as graduates and they, they, they carried bags for a long time and did a lot of training before then they gradually be, were introduced into their own territory and so on. So this, the development of salespeople don't happen like that anymore and I understand why. So we've got to look at other ways to ensure the professionalism of the sales world is maintained and enhanced and really that's my, that's my drive right now. Yeah, and I think that the, the drive for professionalism and sales is, is not from the standpoint of just looking after the profession, but it's, it's what the customer wants. I mean, it's, it's how can you be of service to the customer best? Uh, and, uh, and uh, you're absolutely right, Andy. The, the key aspect of that is making sure the salespeople have the right intent. Uh, and too many salespeople, their, their sole intent and, and, the, and the, what they've got in their mind when they're going out to talk to customers is, how can I close an order? Uh, and, the, and the intent really needs to be all around the customer. How can I help the customer with their business? How can I help the customer create value in what they're doing? Uh, and how can I bring something new to the customer that will help them really drive uh, their business where they need to go? Yeah, and I sort of referred to this in the open, is that we talk about automation, and it seems like some of that stems from the automation, right? Is, the, is that one of the outgrowths, at least... Uh, in many sectors, sales sectors these days, as the inside sales world develops and becomes, uh, you know, more more established and you know more integral to the the selling process, is that you know automation, the use of automation increases, but it tends to take the salesperson that one step further away from the prospect and really the understanding of what they need and and how they could be of service to them. Because there is so much pressure in this automated environment to make sure you have a certain number of contacts that take place and so on and so forth. So how do you reconcile that? I, I'd like to take step back once. I don't think there's anything wrong with technology. In fact, 
as you've mentioned earlier, without it, where would we be? We just wouldn't get the job done. Like, Oh, and immensely jealous of those people that have it today because, as you said, <laughs> you and I certainly could have used it back in the day, back when I was carrying a bag. I certainly could have, I would have loved to have had it. Well, when, it's amazing. When I started, of course, we had a, a, a desk telephone uh, and that's about all we had. Uh, we had. We had a thing called a telex, where it's like it's almost like Twitter now, but you'd send a little <laughs> short message to to somebody on a telex. Yeah, uh, those. That, so, that and the telephone, and then of course anything written would have to go via what they now call snail mail. You know, mm-hmm. No way of getting a message to anybody either via the telephone or sending a letter. Uh, so it certainly changed. So let's not dwell on that. The the, the real issue. Uh, with technology is we a lot of us throw technology at the problem uh, whatever the problem is and this not doesn't just apply to sales but applies everywhere uh, and, and there is so much technology out there that that sometimes we grab at the technology thinking it's going to solve our problem and, and the problem as you mentioned it's, it's it's all about people people use technology so in a, in a sales sense we need to we need to make sure the salespeople one know how to sell know you know have the right intent in what they're what they're doing and selling uh, and we're, if we're going to implement new technology we make sure the environment is right to introduce the new technology otherwise the technology starts driving our behavior and that's where the issue is so you know your, your, your customer starts uh, becoming a, a line on a spreadsheet or a line in your crm system or whatever and and you, and you don't have that human aspect when you go and sell that's well, the issue. It seems so like it's, that's it's, a, it's a change program that you need to really drive. When you, if you're going to put technology in, you've got to make sure the organisation and the people are ready to embrace that technology without changing the right behaviour. Yeah, well, I think unfortunately, I think sort of the cat's out of the bag in that regard. <laughs> at least, at least as I see with companies here in the US, is that you know there's sometimes out of necessity a, a real embrace of 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 technology and automation and sales and quite frankly the salespeople and their ability to really to cope with it and use it effectively is really lagging i think you're absolutely right andy um and that's not the salespeople's fault um that's the organization is not preparing the salespeople to use it um but you know i heard your the last interview you published um uh, and the name escapes me right now but he was talking you know, about the fact that that um, we need to prepare our people much better. We need to train and develop them. Um, and that's a, a long, ongoing process. It's not a two-day training course. Uh, and if you're going to implement new technology, you've got to have the people ready for it. Right. So in this technology-driven environment where you know, we'll take you know, the inside sales reps, the sales development reps that are being tasked with you know, making the initial contact, setting up the meeting or the demo for the account executive, and they've got pretty stringent activity metrics that they need to adhere to is how what are the steps you'd recommend for a company in terms of saying how do how do I start integrating you know this real human to human selling aspect into this role you know the the empathy the inquisitiveness you know the questions because you know they're going to claim that SDRs oftentimes you know I just they don't have time and I, and I always use the example of you know, I'm a CEO, you're a CEO of a company. I get emails from sales emails all the time from sales development reps that clearly they shouldn't have wasted their time sending it to me because, and I know it's automated. So, you know, their actual time invested for me probably isn't that large, but you know, if I'm like everybody else on their list, they're, they're wasting a lot of time. And they're probably doing damage to their brand as well. Well, yeah. So how do you reconcile that? I mean, what are the steps you, you recommend in the work you're doing? I, it, you get back to people and management of people. Um, if you're going to implement systems that are going to make it much more efficient for us to do tasks, you know, send out emails or whatever it is, um, you, you need to be making sure the people are, are doing it in a way in which cre- that creates value for the people that, that they're working with or targeting or, or whatever. Um, and, and this really, one of my bandwagons right now is is our sales management is where I think our biggest shortcoming is. It's not the issue of the salespeople. The salespeople, uh, in many cases, are not being led effectively. Uh, And we need better leaders and better coaches and better mentors in the sales management area. And and, and, and I 
one thing I'll say to every organisation out there: if you're going to plan, if you're currently sitting planning that I'm going to run some sales training, think about what the return on investment is going to be on that. And I suggest that you'll get much more if you've got a dollar to spend, spend it on your sales managers, and that, that and those sales managers uh, it, it, develop them as as really good coaches, really good leaders, and and the, the sales team will develop automatically because the sales manager will be bring bringing them along. So the sales so, managers, I mean, you raise an interesting issue, which is that yeah, you know, there seems to be this this little bit of a conundrum, at least in my mind, is that. You hear sales managers say that they don't have time to coach, and I'm on record as saying, "Well, you have don't have time not to coach because you know your only job is to make your team successful, not to manage the numbers coming off Salesforce and so on." So, what are the real skill areas that you see? Coaching, obviously, being one that you need to invest in your sales managers. Understanding how to manage around the leading and lagging indicators through the sales process is is absolutely vital. And when I say use the word manage there, I, I probably should use the word coach. If you're talking to your salespeople, uh, you know, forecasting is a classic. If you're scrambling to get a forecast together every month and, and, a, and you're not getting it accurate, where's the problem? It's the fact, it's not the fact that you're looking at all the deals that are supposed to close this month and trying to make sh- make sure they do or don't. It's whether you've done, you've invested the time and effort further up in the funnel with the salespeople, looking at their activities and making sure you're monitoring the leading and lagging, lagging indicators back in that funnel, and developing the skills in the salespeople to bring the deals through. Uh, that's often where the issue is. So a sales a sales manager who's focused so heavily on the numbers and the forecast and the spreadsheets and the CRM and so on and not getting out with the sales. But all he's doing is making the job even worse for himself or herself. He needs to be out there with the, with his people, coaching, mentoring, and monitoring, uh, supervising, whatever the, the terminology is for the different activities. Um, and the, you'll, you'll find if they're doing that well, the salespeople will develop, they'll be, understand how to bring the deals through the pipeline and forecasting and all the administrative side becomes so much easier. Yeah, I mean, one of the, well, not one of, the most popular, through the first 100 episodes, the most popular episode we've had so far, as measured by the number of people that downloaded it, was about sales management. Uh, a friend of mine, Mike Weinberg, who you may know. Oh, um, no, Mike. Who uh, the title of that was from a chapter from his book on his new book on sales management, new uh, sales management simplified, was titled "You Can't Manage a Sales Team When You're Buried in Crap." And right. you know he talked about all the all the distractions that are laid on sales managers these days, and really the sort of perverse incentives they're given by by their managers that pull them away from actually managing and coaching and mentoring their people. It's an interesting question. If I asked you, it would be interesting to get your eyes. How much time should a sales manager take 100% of his available time? How much time should they be spending with the sales force, coaching, mentoring, uh, developing, and, and so on, uh, and sales force and customers? Uh, and uh, I argue that you, you really should be trying to target up to 80%. Now, I'd say that's crazy. You can never get to that level. Well, even if you've got 70%, I, can, I know sales managers now that spend – 10, 20 percent mm-hmm. of the time, you know, in the in the area of working in the field, working with their salespeople, coaching, monitoring, leading and lagging indicators, and working back to understand what they all mean uh, and help develop uh, their people. Well, I think what I think part of what drives that though, and this is one of the great unspoken and you know, Mike Weinberg, great book, but didn't really bring this up in his book, and other people I talked to is that you know part of that is is happening. By the fact that there's there's this just sort of assumption, I think, that sales is becoming more and more a numbers game, right? We're seeing this with a lot of the sale, you know, the sort of artifact of a lot of the sales automation is that it's if we just keep throwing messages out there to enough people, we're going to be able to generate enough prospects to meet our number. And that, that then there's a sense that that's always going to happen. So if it's just a matter of chance, right? You know, if you look at the, the idea of being able to develop a prospect, it's just a matter of chance. Then, you know, we don't really need to coach them because all they need to do is keep doing what they're doing except more. 
You, um, before we came on air, you, you talked about the video interviews I do with a whole lot of thought leaders in this region. Um, and one I recently interviewed um, was Dean Kelly. Uh, love doing his interviews. If anybody wants to have a look, go on to the strategic selling dot, uh, sorry, strategic selling group dot com and have a look at the interviews. These are all short, you know, four or five minute interviews uh, with thought leaders. He, he talks uh, uh, about coaching questions for sales managers and how they, they need to coach their salespeople. And he said, typically, the numbers-driven sales manager will go out in there and say, yeah, tell me about your deal, how big is it, when is it going to close? Uh, and that's the conversation mm -hmm, he has mm -hmm. with the salesperson. Uh, and, and Dean makes it very clear that that's the wrong conversation. You need to be having the conversation that that helps the salespeople focus on the customer and the, and the human side of the you know, the conversation he has with the customer, understand, making sure it's focused on customer outcomes and not our outcomes. So if you ask, ask the salesperson, you know, when's the deal going to close and how big is it, what's he going to go and he's probably going to go out to the salesperson, uh, to the customer and ask the same question. And the customer's, yeah, obviously going to look at him and say, hey, you're not on my side. Um, you're not the guy I want to talk to. So... You, know, you need to get the right questions out there. Questions like, you know, what's a business problem we're trying to solve, and, and who, who's that important to, and what's their priorities, and how do we measure success from their point of view, uh, and and have they got an alternative buy, to buy from us, and and you know, who are those alternatives, and all those sorts of questions. Um, that's you know, and particularly, what's the value expression to compel the client to do business quickly. Mm -hmm. And, and yet most sales managers are out there saying, tell me about your deals, when are they going to close, how big are they? Wrong. That, that's not coaching. That's that's managing. That's getting the stick out. That, that's not helping the, the salesperson be successful. Oh, I, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think that, that uh, it's not that it's not that there's an issue with technology. The technology is great. It's that, But it's not the answer. The answer is still... A person selling to a person. Yeah, and we and need so, the so how do you? So how do you? How do the, I think the real challenge for managers these days, and we've talked about this, the challenge for sales reps themselves, and for you know business owners, CEOs, is you have to reconcile these two. Because while you may have growth for some period of time through through automation, playing purely the numbers game. There's going to come a time where you have to be able to sell because the numbers is only going to work so far. I mean, well, we unless you sell in a, an infinite market, which no one has an infinite market, right? We all have fairly tightly defined markets. You know, we know we do better the more tightly we define the persona and the the market of who we're selling to. And of course, with the economy the way it's been for the last since the GFC and so on uh, on a global basis, and it's not getting much better just yet. Um, and probably for quite a while, you, you can't survive on market growth. You, you really have to survive on winning or creating new value for your customer and, and, and leveraging that value for your own reciprocity. Yeah, um, I mean, increasing the contract value and the, the cut lifetime value of the customer. Yeah. Yeah, and absolutely. You only do that by, by creating that value for the customer. How are you going to do that? And, uh, and, and uh, we need to know the numbers. I don't. I don't deny that at all, and, and the systems are really important, but if you take what comes out of the system every day, give me numbers, give me numbers, give me numbers, uh, and you drive that into your salespeople, the salespeople behavior will not be right in the field. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a short break. I'll be back with my guest, John Smybert, who talks more about uh, <laughs> sales management and, and sort of the wide, wide range of conversation we're having about uh, engagement with your customers. Hi, this is Andy. Connect and Sell is used by sales reps at nearly a thousand companies, including hundreds of technology startups and several Fortune 500 companies, to overcome the challenges of getting prospects on the phone. Companies using Connect and Sell grow their revenues faster by enabling their sales reps to have more sales conversations in 90 minutes than they could otherwise achieve in an entire week. Connect and Sell can be deployed directly to your sales reps, or you can take advantage of their outbound on demand service which delivers qualified prospect meetings scheduled directly on your sales reps' calendars. Visit connectandsell.com to learn more about how Connect and Sell can start filling your pipeline today. So welcome back with my guest, John Smybert, joining me from Sydney, Australia. Yeah, and to the point you're making right before the break about 
you know, managing and it's all focused on numbers and so on is that is this is a, a, a thing I see all the time with sales managers and with salespeople is they don't really know where they are or where they stand in a deal. You know, they have a hard time really deciphering. And you know, I find that pretty interesting that what they default to is just, well, I'm at a certain stage, you know, based on what we've laid out as our forecast template in our CRM system. But they don't really understand the depth beyond that, right? Okay, I know we just submitted a proposal. And based on my CRM system, that tells me I've got a 75% chance of winning, which isn't really the case because if three other competitors have also put proposals in, you can't all have a 75% chance of winning. And so all three, all three yeah, the other salespeople have forecasted at 75%. <laughs> forecast 75 as well. So we know the math doesn't work. So, but they rely on that stage. And so I, when I coach VP of sales and sales managers and sales reps, it's, it's oftentimes a really challenging conversation to say, okay, well, fine, you're at this stage, but are you going to win or not? And they, they really can't answer that question. It shouldn't be a mystery at that point. Uh, that goes back to what I was saying earlier. If the sales manager has not been working with them uh, early in the pipeline and making sure, one, they qualified effectively, uh, two, they, they've really done a very thorough discovery um, to understand what the key drivers are, to, to teach and challenge where necessary, to drive the differenti differentiation in the value you can bring to the table and so on. Uh, too, too often the sales manager is not there at that time. And when it comes to the point where the salesperson is saying, hey, uh, I think we'll close in a month and, and we're at a 75% chance of closing, too late to ask those questions then. Uh, you're not going to impact the, the the deal in the process so you need to be back early in the in the deals uh, at that stage yeah 75 percent of closing you know it's not going to happen so you don't put it in your forecast but uh, you haven't solved the problem which is the understanding and behavior of the salesperson and how to sell that you haven't helped them develop their skills and capabilities through the process so if you were a sales manager in that situation let's let's say not at the 75 percent stage but you know, earlier, so what are the questions, if you're working with a sales rep and coaching them or a sales manager, you know, how, what are you coaching them to ask at that, that point in time? What are the things they really need to be focused on? You know, if guys listening, guys and girls listening, you know, what do we need to really be focused on with working with our, our sales uh, reps? I'll, I'll, I'll repeat some of the questions I think Dean Kelly talks about. You know, first of all, what's the business problem that the customer's trying to solve? What, 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 are, they, what are the outcomes they're looking for? and make sure you've got clarity in that. Uh, and, and what's the value expression? What's the value proposition from the customer's point of view? And, and one of the issues, I, the word value proposition puts the wrong connotation in a lot of people's mind. The value proposition is the proposal the customer is making to his own organization on the value of a change that they're going to try and drive in the organization. It's not your particular value on the table. Yes, you need to differentiate your value and so on, but express it as, as, as the, the value expression of the customer. Um, it, it, you know, it, that's the sort of question uh, we need to ask. Uh, the other thing is, you know, the question we, we don't ask enough and, and the salespeople lose sight of and don't get to the bottom of is, what's the process the customer's going through? And we, we look at our sales process and we measure our salespeople on, our, on the sales process, but we forget about the fact that the customer is going through, whether we call it a process, a journey or whatever, and there's steps in that process. Where are they up to currently? What steps have they already gone through? What steps are they going to go through to make a final decision? Because we need a lockstep with that and help them through that process. Uh, and we're going to make sure it's not in conflict with our own sales process. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it Actually, I posted an article um, on LinkedIn here in the last day or so about about this. Is that you know, how you align your sales process and your sales efforts with the customer's buying process, and really important to sort of make a distinction between you know I, I sort of talked about in the sense that the customer has two objectives when they're trying to buy something. One is they have their business objectives, which is you know this is the value we want to receive, this is the problem we're trying to solve, the pain we're trying to cure, and so on. 
but then they have a buying objective as well. And, you know, we want to invest maybe this much time in making this, this decision, this amount of people's efforts. And, you know, this is the steps we're going to go through. You really need to understand what their buying objectives are and align your sales process with that. Because too often there's this huge mismatch. And if you're consuming too much of the customer's time, when they don't want to invest that time, if you're having meetings with them, where you're not delivering anything of value to them, and you're wasting their time, and you just got to find yourself behind the game, and you might as well, you know, no longer pursue it with that prospect. Yeah, and, and often, as as they say in the challenger sale and and the challenger customer, we we're in too late, uh, and. Uh, and often I find uh, salespeople are saying, oh, I'm in the discovery stage of my sales process. And you say, where's the buyer? Well, the buyer's in, <laughs> almost in the decision stage of the process. Uh, and you're thinking, whoa, you're in there way too late. Um, well, yeah. So, yes, you do need to align the buyer and, buyer and selling process. And you do need to understand where you are and where the customer is in that buying process. Yeah, and there's a lot of denial these days about that alignment. Right, because I mean, you start at the beginning, and there's there's a fair amount of controversy. This is you know, an unsettled, and will always be an unsettled debate in sort of the sales space among people that that think about these things. Is that you know how far is the customer into their buying cycle before they engage with the salesperson? Right, is it? And the answers range from you know fifty, sixty, seventy percent to zero. <laughs> and you know people are fairly firm on both sides, so that has a an impact when you think about how do you engage with that prospect. You know, on one hand, if it's zero, when you have that first engagement, well, you're, you're doing top of the funnel selling. That's a little bit different than if you say, look, these people have come to my website. They've looked at what we do. If I lead with a corporate pitch, I'm just going to lose them because they've already invested that time. They don't want to hear that. They want to hear about me, you know, me meaning their own problem. They want to hear about their own problem, what you can do to help with it. Yeah, Andy, you're absolutely right. Um, look... <laughs> To me, that's an argument that's that's uh, that we've hopefully way past. I know there's a lot of salespeople that still don't get it, uh, but the the fact is, you you do need to be in there talking to the customer about the customer, and, and you do need to be teaching. You do need to be challenging, and and you, obviously not arrogantly, and so on and so forth. But uh, um, I, I talk a lot about to a lot of salespeople and organisations about personal branding. The salesperson needs to have a very credible personal brand, and that personal brand is not about around their company and their product. That personal brand is around uh, the domain of the customer, uh, understanding if, if you're selling to a financial industry, understanding the financial industry, understanding the challenges they face, understanding what other people in all other parts of the world uh, uh, in the financial industry are doing to, to overcome those challenges, to drive their revenues up and so on. And bring that insight to the table unless you're doing that in a b2b environment and i'm really talking larger b2b then then don't even bother you you, you can't be a salesperson with a product unless you have domain expertise and can bring value to the table to your customer well and that's yeah that that in itself can <laughs> can trigger lots of debates i mean about you know how much specialized knowledge salespeople need to have these days and you know i've gotten into it with people in the past i i tend to lean on the side and i talk about my first book as you want to get your best product knowledge industry expertise domain knowledge as close to the prospect as possible of course the prospect will always be have more expertise in their specific business but as a salesperson, you have access just out of your own organization and your customer base on a global basis. You have access to all sorts of stories that the salesperson doesn't in this day and age have access to, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Yes, we've got the internet. Yes, we've got all sorts of research we can do. But we will have inside information through our own customer base that, that are gems for our, our potential customers. And with those gems, we can go in and be a thought leader. We can go in and ask insightful questions. But we need to make sure that we understand what those gems are. And it's not, it's not features and function out of product. It's what our customers have done to change their business. And we can bring that to other customers in, in thought leadership. That doesn't mean we're 
a world's best expert and a world's best thought leader in banking or whatever the subject is. But we do bring insight and value to the table and we un need to understand how we position that and how we do create value for the customer and, and gain a level of, of engagement and trust through that dialogue. And right, use that expertise in a way to be able to ask questions of the prospect that they hadn't necessarily thought of themselves. I mean, to me, that's that's really one of the key steps of establishing the credibility and the trust with the prospect is, yeah, you don't have to have all the answers, but do you have the insights that enable you to, and again, to me, the best way you <laughs> deliver an insight is through a question, is ask the question that forces them, forces them to pause and think. And if you're doing that with the right intent, the customer will warm to you very quickly. If, exactly. if, in the, if in the first, second, third meeting you have with a customer, you ever discuss your product or your company, you will lose them. You are no longer that thought leader. You are no longer that, that person bringing insight to the table through the questions you ask. They'll see you as a salesperson with the intent of trying to close an order versus the intent of helping me with my business. Exactly. Well, great, John. Great. We're going to move to the, uh, the last segment of our show. I appreciate all your insights you gave. Uh, I've got some standard questions I ask all my guests, and I, I lead off with a hypothetical scenario that I pose to everyone. And in this scenario, you've just been hired as a new sales leader at a company whose sales have stalled out, and they're stuck, and they desperately want to get unstuck. So what two things would you do your first week on the job that could have the biggest impact? Well, assuming I now have a number of sales uh, managers reporting to me, uh, in my team, very first thing I do is go and individually talk to all those guys, understand the challenges they're facing, understand where they see the issues are in driving the business, understand where they're being successful and where they're not being su successful, what they see as a roadmap. So that's number one. And then number two, go and talk to customers, go and listen to customers about where they see the value we bring as an organisation at the table and where they see the challenges that we've got in helping them improve their business. So it's it's the first week's got to be all about listening. <laughs> it's the same as selling, right? Yeah, you don't nothing, go nothing, out there trying right, to tell nothing everybody what you're going to do. You, right. you go out there and you listen. Okay, excellent. So I've got some rapid fire questions for you. You can give me some one word answers or you can elaborate if you wish. The first one is, <laughs> When you're selling, when you personally are out selling, what's your strongest sales asset? Discovery, questioning, insightful questions, really spending some time with the customer, showing them that I can bring value to the table through the questions I ask, uh, the challenges I can put on the table, the teaching and insight I can bring to the table. Okay. Uh, what I call the discovery is absolutely, it, it lays the foundation for all the rest of the sales process. I agree. Who's your sales role model? Oh, good question. Um, I've got lots of role models I, I monitor. I've been very heavily involved in social media and monitoring and reading what all the thought leaders around the world. And I've got a lot, number of those I've followed, like Jill Conrath and Anthony Arena and yeah, some older ones as well. However, to answer that question, I'd probably go back and a recommendation I make for all young salespeople is find a mentor and find a coach. Sometimes they'll find a coach in their sales manager, the direct sales mm -hmm. manager, uh, but more often than not, it'll be a mentor they'll find somewhere else. Uh, and we all need those. And I think to answer the question directly for me, I remember struggling as a young salesperson in NCR back in 1970 six or seven or whatever it was and I had a sales manager and the thing that I remember most about the sales manager John Hogue um, I'd be embarrassed if he if he hears this but but this this chap decided that I could be successful he really believed in me when I wasn't willing to believe in myself uh, and so for as a role model and a coach and a mm -hmm. mentor he changed my life Excellent. Uh, and, and I say to all the sales managers out there, you'll have individual sales guys in your teams that are really struggling with their with their personal uh, image and, and their commitment and understanding how they can be successful. Just believe in them. Show you believe in them. And uh, it's amazing how they'll turn around. 
Right. So that, that was probably my number one role model. Then I later on I had a mentor that really helped me through a career and I ended up in very senior positions in the IT industry. Um, one of these mentors just mentored me through the whole process. It was brilliant. Excellent. It's a good lesson for people, especially, well, it's really, I've never really too late to have a coach or a mentor, but especially if you're newer in your career, find somebody, as John said, that can, can be that person for you. Uh, and, and just remember, it doesn't have to be your direct manager. Absolutely, right. Mm. In some cases, it might not be. More often than not, it won't. Right. Okay, what's one book that every salesperson should read? <laughs> I'll give you 25. No, you get one. <laughs> hey, look, I, uh, I founded a sales mastermind group here in our region, um, and, and I've got a brilliant bunch. It's 14 people in the sales mastermind group. And I've got to say... Um, there's been some brilliant books that probably are not all that well known in the US uh, that's come out of this group. Uh, and I, look, I'd like to mention four if I can. Sure, go ahead. Uh, one, I know you've interviewed Tony Hughes. He yes. wrote a book called The Joshua Principle, right? which I found absolutely fascinating. He wrote, as a, wrote it as a novel. It was a young sales guy trying to be, you know, uh, trying to develop, and he got a mentor and eventually was very successful. Great book for people, particularly if you like reading a novel. Uh, and in learning about sales at the same time. But just recently, there's been three books published here. Um, one's called uh, uh, Your Roadmap to Sales Management Success by Wayne Maloney. Great little handbook for sales managers. Uh, another one was The Rebirth of the Salesman by Kean McLaughlin. Um, mm -hmm. And he really talks a lot about how we need to rethink the way we're selling. Um, really good book. But I think the real gem amongst them is a book called The Art of Commercial Conversations by Bernadette McClellan. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, she really gets to the guts of, of what the art of selling is all about and, and really, really talks about some of the things we've been talking about in this interview. I'd recommend that one to anybody. Excellent. Okay. Well, good. Well, I, I think it's great that we you know, shouldn't be so US-centric that we think the only people that know about sales live here in the US. And I've a lot of offer down here, down under. Yeah, yeah, and I've been uh, as part of my show. I've I've uh, trying to broaden the range of where we draw guests from, and so we've had many from Australia, Europe, UK. So we're we're trying to expose people to. Uh, I love what you do, Andy. I think you're doing a great job. Oh, thank you very much. So here's probably the tough question of the day: is so what music's on your playlist right now? <laughs> Uh, I was brought up in the real rock era and then through uh, the Beatles and the you know, uh, the Bee Gees. The Bee Gees actually originated here in Australia. That's right. So, uh, we followed, I followed those religiously and and the Stones and so on. But but what really helps me in, in you know, wind down or even wind up is, is classical music. I love it. Yeah, in the background while I'm working mm -hmm. or even go to sleep or waking up, uh, getting energized again, you know, things like William Tell Overture and so on. It's just... <laughs> I'll oh, get you pumped up, right? <laughs> All right, last question for you. What's what's the one question you get asked most frequently by salespeople? Um, how do I find prospects? And the answer is? <laughs> do you, do you, have you got another half an hour? <laughs> <laughs> no, you have about 30 seconds. <laughs> Um, I, I, I guess a simple way is don't forget the old cold call, but get out there and talk to people. Uh, pick up the phone, um, but target. You know, really understand who your target customers are. Understand what your best customer, who your best customers are, and then go out and find more of your best customers out there and go and talk to them with the insight and understanding you've got about your customer base and how you can transfer some of that those real gems across to your, to your new customers. Perfect. Only 22 seconds. And, and by the way, I'm a, a big uh, promoter of uh, uh, social selling. Yes. Uh, in this day and age, there's a lot of value in doing that properly. But two things. If you can't sell, social's not going to help you. So <laughs> That's learn true. How to sell That's true. First. Right? Uh, and then when you get into social, it's not put a toe in the water. It's a real strategic thing you need to invest a lot of time and effort into. Absolutely. Well, good. Well, John, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. And uh, how can people find out more about you? Uh, I guess look me up on LinkedIn. 
um, is is one area. Uh, I run the strategic selling group, as you've said, which is a LinkedIn group, and there is a resource centre called the strategic selling group dot com, where we do all our video interviews of thought leaders and so on. Um, and then the other thing is to look up our sales mastermind group, which is called the SMA Masterminds, which is Sales Masterminds Australasia, but smamasterminds.com. Okay, excellent. All right, well, appreciate it again. Thanks for joining Andy, us. This has been absolutely wonderful. I really enjoyed the opportunity, and thank you so much. My the, pleasure. The- My pleasure. So, friends, remember, make it a part of your day every day to deliberately learn something new to help you accelerate your success. And an easy way to do that is to make this podcast accelerate a part of your daily routine. Listen to it first thing in the morning on your commute or in the gym or use this part of your morning sales huddle with your team. That way you make sure you don't miss any of my conversations with top business experts like my guest today, John Smybert, who shared his expertise about how to accelerate the growth of your business. So thanks for joining us. Until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guest, visit my website at andypaul.com.